Welcome to the Smart Money Tribe podcast. I'm your host, Arisa. I'm the founder of smartmoneyafrica.org, a financial education platform tailored to the African millennial woman. But I'm probably best known as the author of two best-selling personal finance books, The Smart Money Woman and The Smart Money Tribe. I love having money conversations that encourage African women to think bigger and become the chief financial officers of their own personal economies. This podcast is a weekly show that will focus on powerful conversations, stories, and practical lessons that teach African millennial women how to make money, keep money, and grow money. Hey guys, thank you so much for all the love on the podcast. We've been number one in the top shows and business categories on Apple Podcasts all week, at least in this region. But thank you so much for the reviews, guys, the ratings, sharing on Instagram, WhatsApp. Thank you. I'm so grateful. Please keep them coming. So before I dive into this week's podcast, I have a surprise. On the 30th of June, I'm launching something called the Smart Money 30 Day Challenge. It's a 30 day boot camp that helps you take control of your money by making smarter financial decisions. So lots of people have read my books and they love it and they've said it's helped them change their financial lives. But there are also lots of people who have read it but are yet to take action. So the Smart Money 30-Day Challenge is a way for us to do it together. So during the challenge, you will learn how to fix your budget, create a debt repayment plan, create an investment plan. The way that it will work is basically you sign up And you get one financial task in your inbox every day for 30 days. So money can be such an overwhelming thing, right? So the idea is instead of it being this big, huge topic where you have so many things you have to do, you have to fix, and you don't know where to start, we're breaking it down into one action step every single day for 30 days that helps you organize your money and get your life, honey. So if Um, you're interested, it also comes with three smart money toolkits, which are essentially templates that help you tackle debt, budgeting, and investing. So if you're in Nigeria, it costs 50,000 Naira and outside Nigeria, it's $110. So I'm really looking forward to seeing everyone who signs up and working with you. So this week, I wanted to tackle a topic that I would use to kind of answer my most frequently asked question. RSA, what should I invest in? Okay, first of all, I would like to remind you that I'm not your financial advisor. My job is to break down the financial jargon in a way that's relatable and fun and to give you the financial education that you need to have productive conversations with your financial advisors, your investment advisors, or whoever handles your money. So the conversation around what to invest in usually goes like this. RSA, what can I invest my money in that will double it? But I don't want any year year interest rates. So none of all this 2% interest like my savings account or 7% interest like um, treasury bills in Nigeria. And I don't want to lose any money. She understand. So the investment has to guarantee my principal and I need to be able to withdraw it in three to six months. Are uh-uh, you be thief? <laughs> oh, wait. But on a serious note, when you ask, a question like this, right? What you're actually saying is, I'm looking for an investment that gives me a return that will double my money in a short period of time, but protects my capital because I'm not willing to take any risk and it must guarantee my principal. I hate to break it to you, honey, but that sort of investment doesn't exist. It's a unicorn. First of all, it exposes the fact that you don't fully understand the relationship between risk and return. And more importantly, it's the kind of dangerous thinking that leads people to things like MMM, Swiss Golden, or whatever Ponzi scheme du jour. I realize that most of us have heard the phrase, no risk, no reward, or high risk, high return. But when it comes to making investment decisions, do we really understand what risk means? So in this episode, I'm going to share three strategies that can help you manage risk when you're making an investment. <clears throat> so. This is what you need to know about risk. First of all, risk is basically a prediction on the future. So when you make an investment, you're basically taking a bet on a future outcome. 
<clears throat> so, for example, I read an article that said Beyonce did a corporate performance for Uber in 2015, and her fee was supposed to be six million dollars. Get it, sis? <laughs> but instead of taking the cash, she opted for stocks in Uber. Now, this is an example of betting on a future outcome. In this case, Beyonce was betting that Uber stock would appreciate in value, right? Now, after the IPO in 2019, there's been speculation about how much she really made in terms of um, the value of her shares at the time. So some people say that it was $300 million, and some people say that it was $9 million. But the fact is, Tisha appreciated the value. She made hella money. So Beyonce took a bet that may have paid off big time, but it could have also gone the other way. She could have lost the entire $6 million in fees and ended up with zero. Uber could have failed as a business before it reached IPO because even now the company is in the midst of a turnaround and they're fighting to regain their profitability. So companies fail. So it's not every time an investment fails that somebody cheated you. Sometimes the company just didn't get it right. And it could be for a number of reasons. Sometimes it's systemic risk. So maybe the economy is bad, the market has crashed, or sometimes COVID happens. Or sometimes it's specific risk. Maybe they have labor issues, or maybe even the management was incompetent, or they applied a strategy that, you know, didn't pay off and it failed. So first things first, number one thing you need to know is don't let anyone fool you. Every single investment has some level of risk. Even the ones that you think don't. There's nothing that raises red flags for me, like when someone is selling me an opportunity and <laughs> the thing has super normal returns and they're guaranteeing my capital and claiming zero risk. I either smell a scam or a lack of understanding of the product that they're selling. If it sounds too good to be true, sis, it probably is. Even a risk-free rate doesn't truly exist. At least not in practice anyway, because every investment carries a small amount of risk, at least. Let me explain. The risk-free rate is usually considered to be equal to the interest rates paid on a 90-day treasury bill. So treasury bills are considered one of the safest investments because they're backed by the full faith and credit of the government. So the idea is that the government is expected to meet all its scheduled payments and obligations, so no stories. Because essentially, you have borrowed the government money and they pay you an interest for the privilege of using your money to run the economy. But as we can see from, you know, what's happening in Argentina, where they're having trouble paying the, their bonds, it's clear that there's no such thing as a risk-free investment. Because anything can happen and even a government can fail you. Anyway, it's important to note that although I think the government defaulting is unlikely, I'm saying this because we need to bear the risk in mind. Not dwell on it, because if you don't risk anything, you don't get anything. But it's just to prove to you that there's nothing like a risk-free rate, right? So anyway, the risk-free rate or the interest on treasury bills is usually the baseline. So for example, if someone brings me an investment opportunity, let's say they're like, they say, I said, bring 100K, invest in my fish farm, and you'll get 5% interest per annum. Now, when I'm considering this investment, in order to evaluate my risk, I look at what treasury bills are currently doing and decide if it's worth the risk. So right now, treasury bills in Nigeria are around 5% per annum. So an investment in a fish farm, which typically has a higher risk for a 5% return, is unattractive to me because I'm less likely to hear stories from the government about paying back my money as I went due. But with a fish farm, you have to think about many things. Many things can happen. The fish can die. Your employees can steal from you. Regulation can change your industry dramatically. So in order to take these risks, the prospect of the return needs to be considerably better than treasury bill rates. So each person's risk profile is different, right? But your risk profile will determine what considerably better returns means. So for me, it could be a return for 15% per annum. For you, it could be a 30% return that you need in order to be able to take such a risk. It all depends on your risk appetite, which brings me to number two. You have to understand your risk appetite. 
So on one end of the spectrum, there's a risk averse investor. So a person who prefers lower returns with limited risks rather than higher returns, right? And on the other end of the spectrum is the risk lover, an investor who is willing to take on more risks with their investments in order to earn higher returns. So the higher returns are compensation for the fact that they're willing to take the risks that they take, right? See, when I was in my 20s, if you asked me questions about my risk profile, with my chest, I would have said I was a risk taker without hes- hesitation, safe. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't really know how much of a risk taker you are until you've lost money. Legit. <laughs> it cannot be a theoretical thing. You have to feel it. And I've made a lot of money from investments that have paid off. But bruh, I have also lost a lot of money. I need a pain. But you see, over a period of time, the more you invest, the more you have experience, the more you build your risk um, muscle, the more you know what works for you, what risks you're willing to take, how much you're willing to lose, how to calculate the risk, right? But you learn by doing. So I'm still a risk taker, but I have a more calculated, measured view of how I view risk now. So it's not based solely on sentiment, emotions, or the prospect of a hefty return. Don't get me wrong, I love money. And like everyone else, I want to make an investment that makes great returns. However, the new way I calculate risk is by asking myself how prepared I am for the downside. Let me explain. I find that when most people make an investment, they're mostly thinking about the return and they pay lip service to the risk. But like any bet, there are always two sides. You can win or you can lose. But I find that many people in Nigeria especially, can only see the upside, which is how much money they can make, but they never fully consider um, the downside. So someone is looking at, oh, I can make a killing, I'll make 100% of my investments over this period of time, but they never really think about how much they can lose. So if someone comes to me with an investment opportunity, on top of considering whether the return is significant enough for me to take the risk, I also consider if I can afford to lose the money. So in considering how large your appetite for risk is, ask yourself, how does your life change if you bet wrong? So does it affect your financial obligations? Is it your entire life savings that you're risking in Bitcoin? Or does it you know, change your lifestyle? Does it change your cash flow? Nobody likes to lose money, but you need to wait. For example, if I'm presented with an investment opportunity to invest in a business and I'm told to put down 5 million for the opportunity to make me, say, 20 million in three years, right? As attractive as the returns might sound, I have to weigh the prospects of the great returns alongside the possibility that I could lose 5 million. And I have to consider what will happen if I lost 5 million. If I lost 5 million, you know, does it, how much does it affect my life? Is that my entire net worth? Am I going to lose the roof over my head? You know, things like that, right? Is the bank going to be hounding me? Because again, people take loans to make investments that are really high risk that they've not fully um, considered. So pro tip, create your own personal risk appetite guidelines for yourself. Like just make a list of criteria that you would require in order to take on a high risk investment. So you have to have a cap for how much can go into a risky investment, for what time horizon. There are no right or wrong answers, but the more you invest, the more you'll know, you know, where you fall on the risk spectrum. But it's important to set guidelines for yourself. This episode is brought to you by Wealth.ng. Wealth.ng is a self-service investment marketplace based in Nigeria. It acts as a one-stop shop for all your investment needs from the convenience of your phone or laptop. They give you access to a bouquet of investments that range from treasury bills, stocks and bonds to agri-products. Download the Wealth.ng app to find out more. Last, last, the goal is to systematically build enough capital so that um, you can live off the interest. But it's important for you to diversify your investments across asset classes because each asset class has varying risk and a diversified portfolio helps you to manage um, said risk. Treasury bills, bonds and such are considered relatively low risk investments, 
um, with also relatively low returns. Real estate can be medium risk. I guess it depends on the kind of real estate. Stocks are considered high risk and alternative investments, other people's businesses, you know, things like Bitcoin, commodities, they're definitely higher risk on the spectrum. So even higher than stocks, because if you think about the stocks, they're high risk, high return. Um, you probably get a better payout um, over, over the long term um, in that asset class than anything else, but it's very volatile in its nature. So it goes up and it goes down. So it's high risk, right? But at least the companies on the Nigerian stock exchange are, or on any stock exchange are regulated, right? So they have to follow certain rules. So it limits the risk a little bit more than things that are not regulated like Bitcoin and some other people's businesses or like things that are not regulated like alternative investments. So a diversified portfolio helps you to spread your risk and it's wiser to develop a portfolio of assets that collectively carries a lower investment risk because if all your investments are concentrated in one asset class or one institution or one country, then you have way too much exposure, right? Number three, do your due diligence. Don't invest in anything that you don't understand. So before you make a decision, do your research on the company, the individuals that run the company, ask questions about what they're investing in exactly, how they plan to make the returns that they're promising, are they regulated, what gives them a competitive advantage. You know, we all do business in this country, so we know how difficult it is to make money. So if someone is claiming that they're going to give you a 200% return in six months, you have to ask yourself what kind of business they are doing, right? Um, so my book outlines the questions you should ask your investment advisor. So hop on smartmoneyafrica.org forward slash shop to buy the books. The key takeaways from this episode were one, risk is basically a prediction on the future. So when you make an investment, you are taking a bet on a future outcome. Two, know your risk appetite. Are you a person who prefers lower returns with limited risks rather than higher returns? Or are you a risk lover? So are you an investor that is willing to take on more risks with their investments in order to um, earn higher returns? Three, make no assumptions. Don't do no guamoya. That's your for. I heard I went. It is your responsibility to do your own due diligence about the investments that you're making. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this episode and you find it useful. To all the people who won the books from Tenny the Entertainer, she bought 10 books last week and I asked people to send me voicemails. Um, or voice notes on the Anchor app after they listen to the episode. So I've picked 10 people. And when I post this um, episode on Instagram, you'll know who you are. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Smart Money Tribe podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm super excited about creating financial content for African millennial women who want to live a fabulous life but also want to learn how to find the balance between spending on their lifestyle needs and building assets that could protect their financial futures. Mm -hmm.